Baseball is dead. Rest in peace. It's 5.40 a.m. out here in Arizona. Um, I got to catch a car in 50 minutes. So I got 50 minutes to talk shit on this podcast. And uh, when I woke up this morning, saw Jay Hay, saw Dallas, and uh, we started talking about that little Manfred piece that came out. Mm. And uh, I, Evan Drellick had the clips, but apparently this was an interview that he did with Time Magazine. Yeah, an interview with Time Magazine. A little sit down with Uncle Manfred, Time Magazine. Uh, really pulled out some interesting nuggets. I feel like that, like the other executives in the MLB office, they have to sweat bullets whenever he talks publicly because he can't like he he for whatever reason even when he tries to say something eloquently or he's trying to just convey some sort of message it comes out as a, a disaster like i want i don't disaster may be too strong but people are going to take from this and say well uh shouldn't have said that i mean it, we didn't even yeah. really talk about his comments about the Oakland A's a week ago right no, no, we haven't talked about that. I don't uh, think he meant this, it the way that it came out. Like it, it came out as almost like the taunting problem. Oakland A's no, well, fans. Abs- absolutely, that is that is absolutely the problem. Is let's just remove. And, and I have to say it this way. Uh, I think maybe for obvious reasons, you guys will understand. Um, <laughs> let's remove the specific fan base. Okay, let's remove the Oakland A's fan base mm-hmm. from that scenario. And now let's just plug in the New York Yankees. Let's plug in the Boston Red Sox. Let's plug in the fucking Chicago White Sox, where Rob Manfred is then backhanding your team's, your favorite team's fan base's collective effort to take a stand for a feeling that they're having, right? And instead of acknowledging the situation, instead of acknowledging the massive white elephant in the room, a backhanded comment is what came instead. So if you are a Yankee fan and he's like, oh, that's great. It, it was really good to see 10 bleacher creatures out there because it's been two or three for the last. I don't know how long <laughs> they almost filled up an entire section. That was cute. <laughs> like, how would you feel? You know, and, and how my point is, how do you have a steward of the game? How do you have the leader of the game? Supposedly mm-hmm. saying things like that, because ultimately what are fans? That's the fans are owners. Fans they're, are they're shareholders. But ultimately, Jerry, the lifeblood of your seeing, product. There you go. And there's a word though that's used to separate them as fans, and that's called customers. Mm. Right. So I look at you guys, you look at me, we look at each other as fans of this game. We know that we are consumers and ultimately customers, but when you boil it down and you avoid that consumer and you avoid that fan title, and you just throw customer on it, well, now it's easy to sort of deliver those backhanded comments because ultimately it tells you kind of how he thinks of baseball fans in general, not of just one specific organization, but in general. You're quite literally just a price tag. That's all you are. You're a number. You're a number. There is no desire to connect or empathize or sympathize with you as a fan and your plight working 20 extra hours of overtime so you can get the entire family tickets in a lower bowl section and you might show up a little early and get some field passes. Those cost a fucking arm and a leg. So zero sympathy, zero empathy for fans, not a specific team's fans. In this case, yes, a specific team, but that's the messaging. And to Jay Hayes' point, the problem is if it wasn't intended that way, and that seems to always be the defense. (laughs) Yeah. It always comes off that way. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you, Jay Hay, as someone who's an outsider here, you have no <clears throat> emotional ties to the Oakland Athletics. Uh, can you can you see that he doesn't mean it that way? I feel like someone in Oakland is going to take it as a personal attack. And the, like me reading it, I read it. And I was like, come on, <laughs> like, like, I don't know how that can come out of your mouth. And it, like some if so, if that exact quote from Manfred about the A's and their attendance, if I said that word for word 
everyone listening to this podcast would know that that's tongue in cheek and that I am talking shit. But I, I think when we look at Rob Manfred and his tenure as MLB commissioner, I think there's it's quite the mixed bag. Like I think that we we talk about these rule changes. These were things that he talked about wanting to implement from day one. When he first became commissioner, immediately we started hearing about rule changes. It took a long time for a lot of them to to come into place. Um, but I think the feedback and the approval rating of said rule changes has been great. I I, I think Fantastic. it's been, yeah, Fantastic. overwhelmingly positive. That's a yes. that's a that's a great badge of honor for his tenure. But then we have these Oakland A's comments. Um and now the the Houston Astros things that w- that's a separate thing that we're going to talk about. But Jay, hey, how do you, as someone who doesn't have their um, uh, emotions tied to the Oakland Athletics, read those comments? And and what was your reaction? It was great. It's great <laughs> to see what is this year almost an average major league baseball crowd in the facility for one night. That's a great thing. <laughs> There is only one way to interpret that, and I think it's as a smart ass comment. Um, mm. And I, I honestly don't, I don't really care whether it was a smart ass comment that was delivered as such, or whether it was a genuine comment that was delivered in a very clunky manner. Because we are so far past the point where Rob Manfred has lost the benefit of the doubt <clears throat> mm. as it relates to these sorts of comments, and basically every press conference that he gets. If I, I can assure you that, like, as somebody who, uh, if somebody on this podcast were to have worked for Major League Baseball social media at any point, <laughs> then I can tell you that, like, a Rob Manfred press conference is a is a potential dark cloud that hangs over anybody that has to operate <laughs> or oversee social media accounts and the comments that follow that sort of press conference. Okay, and I know that people outside of any media marketing area of Major League Baseball are extremely conscious of the fact that these sorts of press conferences and interviews generate these sorts of comments. Like it's it 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 cannot catch people by surprise anymore. I just wonder how much he reports to the owners, right? It, to some degree, he is he is employed at their at their at oh, their yes. will, right? So yes, yes. He's what the I man. wonder ultimately is how much do the owners care? that he comes off this way in these. And I just have to reach the conclusion that they ultimately do not care because he executes their game plan uh, uh, when it really matters and behind the scenes and that sort of thing. I just, if he takes all the bullets for them or lots of them, sorry, I shouldn't say that. If, if he takes lots of the attention away from uh, the owners, the negative attention, what are they to complain about as it relates to that? That's well, kind of how I see that, it. It's, yeah, like like think about think about the movie Armageddon, right? And what are they doing? They're getting ready to save the world. They're getting ready to do this great thing for this group of people. The group of people being the citizens of the world. But they're going through a list of people that they need to get this job done. And when you're doing that, you are overlooking, you know, like the major major character flaws in an effort to get the best to do the job. Like we got to pull this one guy where they're they're pulling Steve Buscemi out of the fucking strip club, right? Like the guy the guy's getting ready to to blow a gajillion dollars on a and they're like nope, we got to have him though. We need that guy. We need like the guy that's in jail. We got to get him out of jail. We we need him too. And it's like we don't really care what's going on when you're off the oil rig. We don't. It's you're gonna do what you're gonna do. But when you're here. We need you to just we need we need you to go to bat. We need you to we need you to be that dude. All right. So can you be that dude for us? And if that's the case, when you're off the rig, fuck, have at it, buddy. Have at it. The world is your oyster. But when you come to work for us, we're gonna need you to, you know, so they're okay. They're like you said, Jay, it's it's it feels like it's okay as long as the work or the dirty work gets done, as long as he's rolling up his sleeves. And to that point, he is. And and, and to that comment, like it's always helpful to remember what his background is within Major League Baseball. Like when he succeeded Labor. Bud Selig, one of the primary objectives, I would imagine, with all the incoming TV money that was happening around that time 
and the inf- and the massive boon in money making and franchise valuations that were happening at that time, you would think if you were an owner or a group of 30 owners, one of your primary concerns would be long term would be we need to make sure that we are accumulating as much of this new money and incoming money as possible and limiting the power of what is a really, really increasingly powerful uh Union within the game, and I yep. Rob Manfred's background as the lead labor union dog or labor dog on the MLB side, I think plays right into that. So that's that's what they're primarily concerned about. And these clunky interviews are just, I think, ultimately a very small price for them to pay. Um, is how it's viewed. Yeah, yeah, because because uh, there's no there's no arguing that what has happened with the rule changes and things like that have made an impact and I think for the most part a positive impact. For sure. It's just again unfortunate that the individual at the tip of that spear has had the issues communicating with and about customers of the game slash folks that I'd like to call fans. And that is where things <clears throat> ruffle feathers. And yeah. it, optically it is just about as unideal as it could be. And I don't think in the modern game we should be anticipating that a commissioner should ever be a beloved figure for the from the vast majority of baseball fans. Like that's no. never going to be the case, and that's not the case in mm-hmm. any sport. By the way, like you can go around the big four or whatever it is, and while I would guess that Adam Silver has the Adam highest Silver? job approval yep. rating of those commissioners, mm-hmm. like he he's not a perfect commissioner, and has had plenty of issues that if Rob Manford had done them, I think would have received a lot more criticism. But because he's Adam Silver and he's he established a little bit of credibility off the off the bat, he gets a lot more runway on that sort of thing. But nobody's ever going to be like a everybody loves the commissioner, cheer the commissioner on like it's it's much more natural for fans to hate or dislike or or lodge complaints with that person than it would be to be sure. a fan of the commissioner of, of a sport. And it's because he's got to make the decisions that impact the game. And those are tough decisions. And that's not for everybody. And in right. that spot, you're going to be making decisions that piss essentially half the crowd off, right? Every time you make some sort of move, you're probably going to piss roughly 50% of people off. That's a that's a tight spot to be in. It's a tight space to operate in. So you develop some Kevlar. You develop some some thick skin. And the arrows and the attention that you're taking away from the ownership group is something that you just kind of learn to do as you navigate through the occupation and the processes that you go through as a commissioner. So I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't need to like him. I don't have a desire to like the commissioner of our sport. I appreciate what that individual has to do. It's a very tough look, though, when oh, we yeah. start backhanding the customer base. That's the problem. When fans of this game who are responsible ultimately for all of us, Jared's up at 530 in the morning on the West Coast for the first time in his life because baseball fans, because of because of the folks that are listening to this, nobody else. That's the only fucking reason. And that goes all the way to the top of the ladder. The only reason he had a microphone in his face is because of the fans of this game. And that's the group he chooses to backhand. I don't understand it. Yeah, I, I just I just think that when it's not a good sign when I see Rob Manfred's face on the headline of an athletic piece and mm-hmm. my first reaction is this is gonna be good. <laughs> like, that's not <laughs> like any time that he he opens up uh the floor to questions or it's like some sort of deep dive where I've you know I've got a really I've got to open up about this subject. And you're like, okay, where give me the cliff notes. What are all the nuggets on this? And more often than not, that that's the case. Like that is the case with with him. Um, but yeah, I was curious because we never we never really hit on him talking about the the Oakland A's. And uh, you know, if you just because I I've never heard it. I, I don't know if it was heard. I don't know if it was just a written quote or what. Oh no, it was heard. But I I've heard only it. ever Okay, because I had only ever read it, and when you read it, it 
totally comes off as backhanded like oh yeah 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 no they, they they had some fans out there that's nice like they don't normally have them so that's good that they had them tonight you know mm-hmm. just c- completely shitting on a night where oakland a's fans were were the story in major league baseball like the win the the attendance the crowd reactions it was a nice positive story in a season where it was nothing but dog shit that they had to deal with and then you've got the commissioner saying well you know, maybe maybe if you did that every night, then you'd well, slow team. It, <laughs> it's just very like and the first taunting. the first line of his opening the first line <laughs> of the opening of the statement was he was asked, did he see what was going on? And he said, Yeah, I was at dinner with the owners. Uh mm-hmm. mm. mm-hmm. <clears throat> interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, uh we start there, but um you know what I'm uh, Jake, how do you feel about doing the blue moon read yourself? I can do that. Yeah. Jake Jake crushes the blue moon ad reads on uh name redacted. I feel like the folks at home will uh, love his blue moon ad reads here as well. Beer is a tried and true baseball tradition, but Blue Moon is the only beer brewed by baseball. Blue Moon was born in a ballpark, first brewed at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. Make it your one-of-a-kind baseball tradition whether you're at the park or watching from home. With its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale is a -a one-of-a-kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full-flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Blue Moon was brewed by baseball to give you a dose of nostalgia and get you excited for the new season. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something one-of-a-kind? Its bold flavor, bright color, and iconic orange slice ritual guarantee a -a one-of-a-kind beer experience perfect for spring weather. Best served with its signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful bright color, a beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all season long. Keep baseball traditions alive with Blue Moon Belgian Style Wheat Ale. It's one of a kind every time. Check out shop.bluemoonbrewingcompany.com for baseball merch and visit get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket to find Blue Moon delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate you doing that. Uh, so this this came out yesterday. Uh, headline, Rob Manfred second guesses giving Astros players immunity in the cheating scandal. Uh, nearly four years later, MLB, com- <clears throat> MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred thinks that perhaps he should have tried to suspend Houston Astros players after all. In a wide-ranging interview with Time, the commissioner said that he would like a do-over on, quote, some of the decisions surrounding the Houston situation, referring to the Astros electronic sign ceiling scandal. Quote, I'm not sure that I would have approached it with giving players immunity, Manfred said as a follow-up question from a reporter. Uh, Once we once we gave players immunity, it puts you in a box as to what exactly you're going to do in terms of punishment. Yeah, no shit, dude. <laughs> you gave them immunity. You can't do anything. What are you talking about? Uh, I might have gone about uh, the investigative process without that giant, without that grant of immunity and see where it takes us. Starting with, I'm not going to punish anybody. Maybe not my best decision ever. <laughs> well, there, there are some other points in the article that are made, though. Um, as much as that sounds like a no brainer, like, well, that's typically it happens with immunity mm-hmm. is your hands are then tied from there on out. You're going to mm-hmm. be told all of the secrets. You're going to be told where all of the bodies are buried, but you don't get to go dig them up now. Do you, do you see how that works? That's kind of how that works. That's how that exchange yeah. goes. So the problem is, I wish is, I didn't give them immunity. It really limited the, the amount of punishment I was able to give the players. <clears throat> That's like saying, I really wish I wouldn't have sold those pair of sneakers because that really got in the way of me keeping those pair of sneakers. <laughs> now that I think about it, if I never would have sold them, I would have been able to keep them. I'd still have no. them right now. Son it of a... I, I don't know what got in the way, though. It might have been that whole monetary mm. exchange where I then give up the product knowingly and willingly and receive compensation for it. I think that is probably yep. what got in the way of that. And that's exactly what happened. I got paid all of the answers I was looking for. And in return, I compensated well, them with immunity. Well, all right. So then, Joseph. But yes or hold no? On, hold was on. It the, the correct problem, decision. The, what? Well, the problem is, though, and this is this is detail that should be understood because Rob Manfred 
essentially could have found himself, and they talk about this, in a position where you're unable to actually punish a player because of the union's stance or potential stance that there was no clear-cut indication on what rule-breaking took place, and there was no clear-cut indication prior to that rule being broken on what the punishment would be. So typically, we're not able to punish people if they aren't aware of, one, what the infraction could be, and two, what the punishment for said infraction could be. So that was a slippery slope that they were trying to walk, they being Major League Baseball and the commissioner's office, in trying to find these answers is, all right, if we get the answers, are we going to find ourselves in a pursuit of punishment in a place where not everything was clearly explained and communicated prior to these rules being broken? And would that then leave us in a place where we can't punish these players because we haven't done our due diligence in outlining what the infractions are and what the punishment for these infractions are? So that's just something that you have to keep in mind. You have to be aware of because it's easy to just go, oh, immunity? Well, what'd you fucking think was going to happen? But you also have to realize their effort to try to extrapolate as much information as possible. So I don't know, who would me, they, who would they even punish? Fair. What's that? Who, who would they even punish? Well, that's what the article kind of outlines is it says that there was facts, there was evidence or enough perceived facts and evidence to probably make that pursuit, Joe. But that's where we run into what I just mentioned. So if I don't tell you I'm guys saying, what the though, punishment like, which is, which player is the most guilt? Like Beltron for like well, introducing it. Like, well, no, do that's, you get do you get do you get a uh, Bregman twenty games because he hit like had a worse split at home? No, that no, was that's more suspicious. The whole, the whole. I, this is I said this from day one, from day one, and it rings true, and now more true than ever. Like it's like this. This is perfect for my entire stance. You were never going to be happy as a baseball fan. You were never going to be satisfied until you either A, saw video footage of who the individuals were banging on the trash can, or if you heard from one of those players, A, yes, it was me, or B, A, it was that dude. That's the only way that you were ever going to be happy, ever, ever. There's no other solution brought to you other than that that satiates the rabid appetite for punishment from fans all across baseball. That is the only way, is if you had Carlos Correa putting his hand up saying it was me, or Carlos Correa pointing a finger at Jose Altuve or whoever it may have been, right? That's the only way you were going to be happy. And those answers were given. There's no way they could have known that Evan Gaddis would one night get drunk and spill the beans on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and that dude was just like, here it is. I mean, he, he just said that they hit the trash can one time against the Yankees. Well, was that the playoffs? <clears throat> yeah, but see, was that the Evan, playoffs? If, was he saying when Evan Gaddis said, "What was that game?" But he's what he tweeted. He said he said that they were they have they were using the trash cans against CC. Uh, but I mean, like they, he he they, that wasn't the first time he one of the biggest things that's ever gone under the radar in baseball history was. I want to say it was 2021 because I was, I think I was in a hotel for Coley's wedding. So it would have been the day before the MLB draft in the summer of 21. Evan Gaddis went on some random Houston Astros podcast and just explained everything that happened. And none of the audio made it mainstream. Like nothing made the rounds. Like for whatever reason, we didn't run with it or play it. But <clears throat> I don't think we had the soundboard back then. But he he explained who did what and how it worked and all that shit on a podcast. It's just like a no, literally a, a what do you small, mean? Like, he so so he said everything that I just asked for. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> like he went into I, detail. He didn't I, beat around I find the bush. That- I, I'm not. I'm not telling you that you're wrong. I would like to believe that if Evan Gaddis was like, "Look, it was 
Correa with the candlestick in the library, um, someone's going to catch wind of that and someone's going to make that public. So I would find it hard to believe that even after listening to this podcast, if that audio is yeah. out there, I'd like to think that audio is going to surface here sometime mm-hmm. soon. Well, they wrote they wrote a whole book about I this guess, thing. I feel like we Evan kind of did. yeah, Evan, the other Evan. There's a lot of information about Evan. this. I, I don't know, like, because it's like you got you you make you. We're not going to punish players, but if you could punish players, like, do you punish the guy who came up with it? Like, if everybody did it, are you going to suspend the whole team? Well, that, that's, it's, I think it that's seems, I think that's the. I think maybe that's the second guessing of the decision at this point is like, I guess I, I'd also like to know what spurred this thought, you know, like why, why is he rehashing you think, you think this? Rob's or, smoking that loud. <laughs> <laughs> like why, like what is, what is going on where he's processing this stuff or he's thinking about this stuff? What brought it up to make him feel like, you know what? It's Tuesday. And I've had this on my mind for a while. Why didn't, why didn't I punish those fucking guys? Why did I give them immunity? You know, where is this coming from? I guess. I mean, I think it was Mm. just like the time interview was a wide ranging interview. That was, I think they probably just didn't rule that out as a, as a topic, as a Um, a topic. Yeah. Cause they talked about rule changes. They talked about like the diamond sports group stuff they talked about streaming they talked about like they once again talked about the oakland a's um like this the dodgers pride night stuff like it was all over the place so i think it was just yeah i don't i don't think it was like rob sitting one there one day and be like hmm you know what i'm regretting these days you know Mm. um i mean the question was well there were two questions one the question was one thing you wish you had done over uh, by the interviewer, um, and that led him to say there were a few things, but uh, some of the decisions surrounding Houston, um, and then the follow up in the Houston sign ceiling situation specifically. What do you regret? Um, and then they, he he answers the question. Got gotcha. you. Hmm. I, I respect him for answering it honestly. I'm, I'm yeah. sure that they're are plenty of baseball executives that would have just stood by their guns because they know he's already been heavily criticized as it is. And now you're going to just openly say, Hey, one of the biggest decisions that has ever defined my legacy. I wish I could have that one back. Actually. Like now you're just opening yourself up to more criticism, which yeah, I, yeah, I respect the honesty because I, I think we would probably sit here and if, if, if the shoe were on the other foot and he were asked the same question, Hey, What's something that you want to have a do over on? And then he picked something that was minuscule or um, just an I'd make the bags even. We would bigger. probably be sitting here. Yeah, like it, like if if we would probably sit here and be like, really, you wouldn't you wouldn't have done the the Houston thing a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, I, I respect the honesty so, on it. But and, and you know what, Jared, that also kind of gives you some some insight, and I think gives credence to the thought of he will answer the question. Even against at times, probably some better advice to to maybe steer clear of some things or try to address things with a broader brush. Where he's like, you know what? No, uh, you're going to ask me the question. I'm going to give you a fucking answer. Rob Manfred may just be that dude who will let you play a stupid game so he could give you a stupid prize at the end of it. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to ask, I'm going to answer, and that might not always bode well. But I think if you're just again, trying to not crucify the guy and you're trying to maybe see some human elements there, that could be it. Like the fact that he's willing to Mm. openly acknowledge that this could have been differently, could have been done differently. I'm not going to call it a win, but it's, it's almost like you're seeing, like I said, the human side of, oh, well, that probably wasn't my best hour. I'd like to do that over if I could. I don't think I can at this point. So it's almost like moving forward, what does that do? Does that buy him credit with with the fans? Does that buy him credit with other players? Or is that now 
an even bigger step maybe in the wrong direction as far as optics with him, the fans, and other players. Like, fuck, dude, we told you that probably wasn't the route to go when you were going that route. And now here we are later down the road. Well, do you give him credit for being honest then? What's it? Do you give him credit for it? Yeah. I, that's Yes, I, I said so. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that's the right answer? If you were to I, be in the interviewer's chair and you ask him, what's the, what's the one thing that you wish you had a do-over on? Is it giving Astros players immunity? I, yeah, at this point, I'm not sure. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I have my opinions about how the lockout went. I have my opinions about how the negotiations during the lockout went. Um, I have my opinions about how at times, you know, the very reason that we wake up and put a uniform on in the morning has been dismissed. I've, I've got my feelings about that. Um, but at the end of the day, if I'm going to ask you to be as open and honest with me as you can possibly be under the circumstances, and that's what you give me, then I would be a massive asshole to take issue with you giving me what I've just asked for which is your open, honest answer and opinion on subject matters just like this. Because from there, what do you want to do? Do you want to now spend the next week attacking Rob Manfred for, for maybe doing something he would like to do over? Where does that get us as an industry? So let's take the honesty, and now let's hope that we can move forward, and let's remind this individual of this moment in time where you don't always have to just stick to the guns that you think you're sticking to or that you have to allow yourself some grace and allow yourself an opportunity to see this, whatever it may be from a different perspective before you make a decision that you will again, regret. If he regrets this, it means that he, that he knows that he has a player in his head or a few that he wants to suspend, wishes he suspended. And I want to ask him that who the fuck, who is the baddest Astro of them all. Who do you want to suspend, <laughs> Who's the Mr. Man? Manfred? And let's see how honest he is then. If we're giving him credit for being honest, I'll say, Mr. Manfred, thank you for your time. Who was the biggest scumbag in the Astros in 2017? And who do you want to suspend? Maybe it's Evan Gaddis. Who do you maybe think that's he'd say? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've, Evan Gaddis. Maybe it's Evan Gaddis. <laughs> you, you've, done a, you've done a lot of research on this, Joe. Who do you think, who do you think he would pick? I don't know. I guess the only one I could think of is Beltran, but didn't, I mean, he's the guy who kind of got, fu- only guy who got fucked for it, really, other than Hinch in terms of. What do you mean, like, other than actually, Hinch? No, no, stop, stop. Aura. Other than Hinch? Are you talking about okay. other than the manager of a baseball team right now? Like, no, nobody yeah. got fucked. Nobody got fucked. Oh, uh, People a little got bit. punished. No, no, no. Uh, Beltran, to your point. And he, but get nobody fired got from, t- 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 he got fired. Who? Beltron? Hinch. And what and is AJ Hinch, Hinch doing today, again. Joey? What is AJ Hinch doing today? Well, not managing the Astros. Beltran never He's managing the Beltran shitty ass Tigers and again. not the, No, that, that's why I said another. no nobody outside of Beltron in this instant got fucked. That was the phrase that they got fucked. No, no, no. I will not stand for, not for one minute will I hear that either other individual got fucked when they are managing a baseball team right now. I'm not telling you that they shouldn't be. Let's get that abundant. Uh, well, Jeff Lunau, Jeff Lunau, I Jake. believe, has still not worked. Yeah, believe it out. Uh, Jeff Lunau has not worked in baseball since. Lunau. Okay. Pinch. Uh, kind of. I mean, Jeff Lunau may be the least sympathetic character involved in the entire cheating scandal. Yeah, so so like as far as yeah. getting fucked, no, he got punished. He got punished is what happened. He got punished. He didn't get fucked. This he is got a dumb punished. semantics thing that you're doing. <laughs> he got it, fucked. It's semantics. Fu- fired. Not fucked. No, I just fired. think it's absolutely bananas <laughs> to think that somebody got punished for their involvement, has a job now, and it can well, yeah. still be looked at as them getting fucked. What? Well, dude, think <laughs> no about, got a raw think about deal managing... Here. The Astros compared to managing the Tigers. Like to me, you got fucked, bro. You got to manage. Well, the think Tigers about now. managing in general or not ever <laughs> managing again. What would be worse? I don't know, man. The Tigers. Are I don't know, man. Terrible. The Tigers seems pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody yeah. got hosed. But that's. Yeah. 
Interesting. Outside of out, well, like, especially, especially when the other two guys do have jobs in baseball, are managers of baseball teams, and the third guy who was all set to be a manager of a baseball team is no longer even an option. So out of anybody involved, I've got to figure in that, that Beltran has had the option too, though. I feel like Beltran is not one of. The, I don't think he's blackballed. I think he's more probably at this point embarrassed. He probably doesn't want to. Uh, draw more attention for like his Hall of Fame candidacy. Like he got outed in the Astros thing, and he was supposed to be the Mets manager. Gets fired before he can manage a single game. Has not resurfaced since outside of some uh, booth media appearances. Um, so yeah, I, I I would have to think he's trying to lay low at least until he gets into the Hall of Fame. Then he can pop back up and be like, I'm ready to manage again. Like I, you don't think that Beltran's blackballed, do you? Um. Oh. Mm. No, it's that's uh, tough because trust me, I've thought about that whole Hall of Fame thing, and and it's it's funny because it's it's crazy to think that he has to lay low so that that could take place, so that that can run its course, his Hall of Fame candidacy potential election, and then on the other side of that, once that happens. He would then be openly allowed and embraced and welcomed back into the forefront of the game. So right Mm -hmm. now, don't even go public. Don't say anything. Don't try to attach yourself to any trailer right now. Lay low. Well, why? I want to be a part of baseball. I want. Yeah, I just uh, that could affect your future. Mm -hmm. Uh, So instead, let's wait to put you in the most hollowed hall of possible the hall of fame and then once we do that and we can overlook all of this stuff that we're afraid of you involving yourself in right now then we can re you know then we can <clears throat> can have that conversation about you coming back like that's what hmm. yeah yeah well, if you read that if you read the book about it the like evan drellick book it makes like like Beltron is like the guy they kind of pin it on, as according to all the uh, out of all the players at least. Well, like Jared he said, outside or, uh, Jared, Jared mentioned Lunau, but there's nobody else involved in this that isn't where they ultimately want to be outside of Carlos Beltron. Everybody else is right where they want to be on the baseball field, employed in Major League mm-hmm. Baseball outside of Carlos Beltron. And Olu now. Yeah. And Evan Gaddis. No, I think he's yeah. right where he I mean, all he did, it's not be. like he, he, yeah. Uh, Beltran didn't get suspended. He just got fired. Yeah. Like Cora and, and Hinch AJ got, got fired. Suspended. And then immediately got jobs the second that they were eligible. Mm-hmm. So, unless. Well, and that's. Unless whatever the, the the back channels in Major League Baseball, I'm, a lot of people talk. I'm sure a lot of people have information there. Uh, so it's like, oh, man, if he's the ringleader, I think that that's the more heavy implication. It's like, is he laying low because of his Hall of Fame candidacy? Or are people in baseball circles now saying like, oh, uh, like, you know, we we can rehire someone that maybe had something to do with it. But do we want the mastermind on our payroll? Yeah. Well, those are those are because you're going to have to answer those questions inevitably, right? Sooner or later, when that first yeah. initial press conference comes, you know, was there any thought about the involvement or potential involvement of Mr. Beltron during the managerial interview process? How do you expect him to handle questions like this? Move And it's like, okay, great. We were here to introduce our manager. Is this what we're doing? So, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing because we haven't been able Someone's to talk to chicken him. nuggets are done. <laughs> Uh, also, I think when you're when you're doing the interview process and you're you're talking to other candidates to fill this managerial void, how do you look them in the face and tell them that that guy is more qualified than you? Because he was smart enough to develop well, a high level cheating system that produced a World Series <laughs> title and you know Boom. a dominant dominant <laughs> offensive run. Yeah, that's the type of brain I want yeah. on my team. If we can yeah. if we can clean it up a little, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah if we can go a little more undetected this time that would be huge <laughs> lessons learned man but Come as on. i've said before i i 
I'm not like a Astros cheating hater. I'm more just fascinated by it. Like there's no persecution in my voice when I talk about this subject. I'm more just interested and curious and fascinated that it took and, place. Like yeah, it's still and, and, mind blowing to me that it's something that happened. And ans- and answer this, Jared. If you had names and specific involvement and the level of involvement attached to each one of those names already, you wouldn't ever think about this again. You would just know it would be fact, and then you would move on. You would never it's harbor. It's very Stanford prison experiment type shit where, mm-hmm. like, because I've heard guys talk about that where they're saying, you know, Beltran walks in the clubhouse and that dude tells you this is what's up. This is what we're doing. And people just fall into line because who's going to check him? Who's going to say, actually, guy, we're we're not doing this. Okay, like that. It's very just, hey, the uh, the inmates are running the asylum right now and you're either going to fall in line or you're an outcast on this team. Um yeah, I, I, the movie again. I, I'm shocked. Did you see that? There's already a documentary about this fucking Titanic uh, submarine coming out tonight. Like the, the fuck, they haven't even fucking found it yet. We don't even know the status of these people. Documentary is coming out tonight, and we um, we still don't have a Houston Astros cheating scandal movie. What the fuck? Well, I think that documentary is coming out because that CEO did a lot of talking before going down into the ocean, and unfortunately, I don't think that that documentary is going to reflect well on him now. Uh, so be careful what you, be careful what you wish for on how quickly documentaries are turned around on you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, the parallels of the Titanic. I mean, people keep you know they forget that the Titanic was unsinkable. Now you get this CEO being like, "We're going to the Titanic. There's a zero percent chance this thing's gonna fuck up. We are the most indestructible submarine to ever visit the Titanic." How about the guy? How about the guy that had that had taken a trip on it? That's come out and be like. It took us fucking almost three times to get down there. Like the fucking there was there was water sealing that was breaking. There was electrical issues that were fucking up like almost immediately into one of our dives. We had to turn around because shit wasn't working. But eventually we got down there. It's like, hold on. What the fuck? Eventually you got down there. So you ran into three different scenarios where the submersible you were in just was not going to work. And you're like, yeah, let's give it another shot. Fuck it. Yeah. Also, uh, Dallas was correct. The James Cameron submarine costs like, why do you keep calling it a submersible? It's a fucking submarine, dude. <laughs> trying to fucking act like you're a doctor or something. You get a PhD. <laughs> uh, submersible. Yeah, the submersible could get down. It's a fucking submarine. Shut the fuck up. Uh, but I'm, the James I'm Cameron fucking, submarine a, did cost millions. So genius. I'm issuing an apology. Did- I stand corrected. Uh, Dallas was right. But by the way, also on the James Cameron submarine, I saw a, an image Showing the relative depths of where the Titanic sits versus where James Cameron got to. Child's play. Mm. The Titanic stuff is nothing. James Cameron went to like the molten core of the earth. (laughs) No, I'm serious. He went to like the bottom of the Mariana Trench or whatever it is. It's like the it's like the deepest any person is ever part of the the ocean. Yeah, that any any human being has ever been. That was him. James Cameron. What totally the fuck different did level. you do that for? That was not what because, it's like, this it's like all spurred it spurred off of this, off of his travel to the yeah. to the Titanic. He was then like, oh well, like like so the he's story I told to you. The depths is what you're saying. Yes. The story that I told you about the Rolex, about the watch, the sea dweller, like that's a that's a real story. They they strapped the prototype to this watch on one of James Cameron's submarines and sent it down with him to test the depth viability because because he was going down like because the watch is the watch is viable to up to 20 or 12,800 feet I believe yeah 3,900 he's a fucking depth junkie James Cameron James Cameron got a taste of the Titanic and he this first question when he came back up had nothing to do with the Titanic he was just like of how much more. deeper can we go? Yep. He's like fucking. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know, you know I, I could see James Cameron right now cruising in his one man submersible, just fucking doing barrel rolls at Summer. the bottom of the Mariana's trench, listening to Adele rolling yeah. in the deep. deep. 
His <laughs> thing was the called shit out the Deep life. Sea Challenger. It was like a literal <laughs> Deep Sea Challenge. He was like, I'm going to yeah. go as deep. Fuck as you, God. You can't make it deep enough. <laughs> I'm inside you. That's. Uh... <laughs> I love James Cameron. I can't wait to see that that documentary tonight. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to. It's going to be quite the, the the experience. You can't buy tickets to go to the Titanic at this moment, but you can buy tickets to games. Uh, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets with their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun that you'll have. Not this weekend, but next weekend, I will be in Chicago, Wrigley Field, guards. I'm going to see the guards and the Cubs, so I'm using uh, game time right now to get some tickets to that series. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, uh, theater, and more. G- game time guarantee means that you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Get images of your seat before you buy so you can know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. Download the GameTime app, create an account, use the promo code Jared for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, use the promo code Jared, J-A-R-E-D, for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Um, Before I get a jet out of here, uh, I did... I did um, want to say... That yesterday, when I was interviewing the players that uh, I had mentioned, Bryce Eldridge was first, Enrique Bradfield was second, Max Clark, and Blake Mitchell. These are all first round dudes. Um, Max Clark, this kid had an entourage. He had a sea of fans that were following him around. There is a YouTube video that was calling him like the most viral uh, player or prospect in the draft is 100% true. And you would think because I was going over his numbers, Mm -hmm. he hit 646 this year and he throws 99 off the mound, 18 years old, good looking kid. I was like, he, he's got to be cocky. Nope. He was very humble, uh, very professional. He was, he was very um, polished is the word. Like when I'm asking him these questions, he's responding like a, like a big league vet would. Um, I was very impressed. But yeah, I think I've seen some mock drafts where he'll go as high as four. But Joe, I feel like you're you're in the YouTube, the baseball YouTube world. What do you what do you got on Max Clark? I thought he'd be good number one. He's the most viral. He should be number one. He's, <laughs> well, I think what was it? Keith Law said that if he was in last year's draft, that he would have been a one one. Ooh, they're sl- they're preying on his downfall. Damn, he'll be motivated. I think they're just saying that this this draft has more talent. Ooh. I like all the kids in the draft this year. I, 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 if it was up to me, I'd draft them all. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. But Jared, was uh, was it confirmed for you that you just do not want any part of these high school kids coming in? Say that again. <laughs> was it confirmed for you that you just do not want any part of these high school kids coming in? Like how you how you wouldn't go? Oh yeah, and. and <laughs> oh yeah yeah like yeah these kids like i was watching some of their bp um they've got like 111 exit velos off the bat mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's it's god given i mean like Woody's, there, Woody's. there was this one kid in there there's this one kid in there uh lanky like he had chicken legs. He's got wiry arms. Tall. He's a tall motherfucker. Leverage, Leverage um, baby. But in there looking like he he's 16 years old and just walloping baseballs effortlessly. Uh, and yeah, the exit velos were like a buck 10 plus. 
And I'm like talking to um, one of the guys over there, like one of the scouts down there. And I was like, oh, he must be like a first round. He's like, yeah, I don't think he's going to get taken this year. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you've just got these kids that, I mean, the talent is off the charts. And it's stupid. I think dude. what I was just most impressed by is how polite and nice and kind they all were versus like, if I had that kind of talent when I was 18, I would have been the biggest piece of shit of all time. Like I just well, would have been absolutely like nothing about any of their vibes gave off fraudulence. Like they weren't like pretending to be humble. They just were yeah. like it. Like I can detect that. Like if you're fake nice or if you're just like playing a character of a nice person, I can detect that. Uh, all these kids. We're just like happy to be there. Just like confident, no doubt. Sure. Like they're comfortable in their own skin. They're confident in their ability. But none of them gave off the impression like I'm better than you and I know it. Well, good. I think that's a, a testament to hopefully the way that they have been raised and their coaches as well. Because that's a lot to handle as a young athlete being on that kind of stage, being placed on that pedestal locally, no doubt, wherever you're coming from. You know, this is, that's why combines, perfect game events, things like that. Like this is the best of the best of the best, right? That's what the big leagues is comprised of is your all-stars, all-stars. And as you start to creep up through these ranks and you come here and we're talking about starting your professional career, everybody here's the best all-star on their all-star team. And there's a certain amount of like moxie that kind of comes along with that. So it's really nice to hear that there isn't the pungent odor of look at me that I think you can get from social media. And especially when you're referring to one of the guys who's potentially the most viral presence in this draft, being somebody that's fairly grounded. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great. Um, I was kind of like, uh, like the kid Blake Mitchell, I fan for life. Fan for life. We inter I interviewed him for like all the interviews were like two minutes. Like I probably asked like three questions max to each each guy. Um, but I got to talk to Blake because uh, he was my last interview yesterday. We probably talked for like an hour um, down on the field, like talking about, you know, the Team USA stuff, like who he played against, who he played with, like some of these other kids that are going to be in the draft and just had a ton of information. And like he's a catcher. So uh, he he just he had mental notes on everybody and uh it was just fascinating to talk to someone like that that's that he was born in 2004 dude he was born that's i was crazy. like bro I was, I was a sophomore in high school like i have actual like baseball memories like going to fenway and, and like when you were when you were just born uh um, i was in fucking yeah, low like, way <laughs> 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 like some of these kids they are they're gonna be first round draft picks this year and they were born when i was in high school the red sox were winning the fucking world series in 2004 these kids were just taking their first breaths of oxygen uh, i know it's a sensitive subject today uh talking about taking breaths of oxygen but it needed to be said um so yeah i i think you know i think the the mlb combine uh, it's serving its purpose. If you if you tuned in and you watched it on MLB Network, uh, I think you can see like it gives you rooting interest. At least for like I'm the one asking the questions, but if I was the one watching at home, you have an idea what their personality is like. You can probably sit there uh, as a fan and now on draft day be like, I remember that kid, or like, I, yeah, like I. I, I I heard some of his answers, what he had to say, and now I'm excited for him. Before, like I, I've watched the draft in years past, and you sit there and like they're like, oh, you know, like fucking the 23rd pick is so and so, and then you just you feel nothing because you're like, I don't know who that is. Like I've well, never heard this, of that person before. But now, what, what, I I think what this does for baseball differently than it does for football too is football fans they can watch the combine. And then they can see the draft position and you can almost bear out the impact of this player on your team because that guy's going to be on a team next year. He's not going to be a part of the team, 
You're not going to have to follow up how he's doing on the practice squad for three years. Like that guy's going to go from running the 40 to returning kicks or running a fucking nine route, taking the top off the defense. That's going to be how that guy plays out. So in baseball, what it provides them and baseball fans is a glimpse at the start because there's no doubt when these guys get called up, what's going to happen. They're going to be able on MLB Network to play clips of their rounds of BP at the combine, of their bullpen at the combine, Mm -hmm. right? So many years ago. Here's what it was when he entered. Here's where it's at now. And it's just an awesome tool to utilize to, you know, it's like a time capsule to take fans back to when it started and now here in the present day. All right. Well, while Jared is entering the stream of flight, you... You should also be entering the streaming situation. And when it comes to streaming, the first draft pick, the first one of one overall, this guy was banging balls at the combine. What's his name? Max. That's that's who it is. <laughs> Max has the best entertainment for whatever mood, whatever mood you're going to find yourself in. For me, sometimes drama, my go-to right now, Secession, we've been talking about this, sometimes superhero movies. Joe, you're a big Shazam guy, right? I know this. Nah. Batman, Shazam, they got it all. Some days, maybe I want to check out what it's like to try to fix a hot water heater. I don't know. A little fixer-upper, little renovation job. That's what fixer uppers for. Well, welcome home, hometown. The list goes on and on. Hour later, I might crave something like comedy. Maybe I want to laugh. Curb your enthusiasm. You ever heard of it? Duh. Big Bang Theory? You into planets, Joe? <laughs> I know you're into Uranus. Mm. And if I'm watching with my family, we love classics like Max, original Sesame Street. Girls love Sesame Street. Huge fan of Big Bird. Jay, hey, Isla fan of Big Bird? Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. And Elmo. Knew it. it. Mm -hmm. And Elmo. Let tickle him, too. Uh, The the original series, Gremlins, Secrets of the Mogwai. I mean, there's a whole lot going on. Don't wait to pick the best of streaming entertainment with Max. Something for every mood you're in. Anytime, it's always a W. Always a W. You know that first round draft picks hit all of the time, every time. Make Max your first round draft pick. Remember, plans start as little as $9.99 a month. Max, it is the one to watch. Remember, subscription is required, so visit max.com. I think now. We're going to go ahead and bring this to an end. Jay, hey, do we have some final thoughts? Um, before we get to your final thoughts, yeah. I just wanted to highlight the Cincinnati Reds. Nice little 11-game run they're on right now. Uh, 10th through the 21st. From June 10th through the 21st, the Cincinnati Reds have compiled a collective 3.65 ERA. We talked about the starting staff and what that looked like. Well, they're sitting at a 4.01 ERA for the starters. bullpen. A little better, 3.16 ERA during that time. Uh, the boys are hitting 260 collectively. That's good for 13th in baseball. Uh, during this stretch, they have hit 18 homers. That's third, tied with Texas. They've been swinging it well. They do have 15 stolen bases as a group, so they're making shit happen on the base path as well as banging the ball out of the yard. Uh, that is tied for second with the. Oakland A's or the running Estuary Ruiz's, if you will. And they have scored 68 runs during that time. That is the third most runs in baseball over that 11 game span. So that is how it's getting done for the Cincinnati Reds. Jay, hey, you got some nugs popping up in the oven? Yep. Uh, Giants 10 game win streak plus 49 over that stretch. Uh, I want to call out two individuals in particular, Tyro Estrada. Uh, Now tied for seventh in the NL among position players in wins above replacement. Um, Maybe the most under the radar high end season going on right now. Some of that is defensive, so it's not surprising it's under the radar, but nevertheless. And uh, the great Lamonte Wade Jr., as I like to call him, uh, 415 on base percentage. Uh, The only guy in Major League Baseball ahead of him is Luis Rise. Oh, he. Tied with Juan Soto. Late night Lamont. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
And uh, let's see, the Rockies. Now let's go to the negative side because you know I like to do that. Uh, the Rockies, it's been flying under the radar because the fucking buckos keep losing. But uh, the Rockies <laughs> themselves have an eight game losing streak and are five and 18 over the last 23 games. They've been outscored by 36 runs over that eight game losing streak. So they have sunk like a stone, uh, kind of like we thought they were. Sometimes it takes time for these things to work themselves out. Uh, <laughs> mentioned the Pirates. Their losing streak reached nine straight games with yet another loss to the Cubs yesterday, eight to three. Uh, they've scored five total runs in five games. They have been outscored by 43 mm-hmm. runs over the nine game losing streak. Uh, they are now down to the third worst run differential overall in the NL on the season. Their bullpen has posted a 9.62 ERA during the nine game losing streak. So the bullpen letting them down uh, and they've hit somehow 078 with runners in scoring position during the nine game losing streak. They are four for 51 with runners in scoring position. So that's a good brand of baseball to watch. And then uh, final note. Uh, Sandy Alcantara had another rough start last night. The reigning NL Cy Young winner, seven innings pitched, five earned runs. Um, it was speculated, I think we mentioned it on the podcast, that it's possible that he would be impacted by uh, the shift rules. And to some oh, yeah. extent, that does that does seem to be going on. His overall mm-hmm. batting average on balls in play is up 33 points from where it was last season, from 262 to 295. His batting average on balls in play on sp- Ground ball specifically is up 60 points from where it was last season. And then this doesn't maybe have so much to do with the shift, or maybe it does, but uh, batters are hitting 403 against Alcantara with runners in scoring position this year. That mark was 233 last year. So 170 points difference. And that 403 for context, that's 32 points higher than the next worst starting pitcher this year. So it's not even close. He's on a completely different level uh, than any other pitcher in baseball right now. Um, I'm not really sure if the ground ball stuff can be fixed. Yes. I'm just going to tell you. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it can be fixed, but dive into the pull side stuff, too. Um, Yeah, it is. I looked at it. It's pull side ground balls is like 48% uh, batting average is up or 48 points of batting average from last year. So that's that's yeah. something too. Um mm-hmm. yeah, it's not good. Cuz I did, I did a cuz when we were there, I did a deep dive on that and I was fucking blown away. I wish I had that in my notes right now. I left that fucking book at home. But dude, that was like that was that it was astonishingly obvious that that is what's happening. That the shift is undoubtedly impacting El Contra right now. Undoubtedly. It's look it's almost like he and Seeger are the prime examples of what the shift could do and what the shift could take away. That's that's the other that's the thing we've we haven't really talked about and we would this would be a conversation we would save for when everybody's here but like the rules how we we all love them, right? But it has done real things to how players are being evaluated too. Like yes, the high end examples are are Alcantara and Seeger. But then you also have the idea that like catchers who are able to who have strong throwing arms, who are able to throw out runners are probably more valuable than they were a year or two ago. Right. Because absolutely teams had deprioritized stolen bases offensively. So why would you prioritize it from a catcher? And then all of a sudden it's valuable or more valuable again. It's it's interesting. I'm I'm interested. And then, you know, the speculation that the pitch clock has led to arm injuries or injuries in general for pitchers. I've seen information on both sides of that debate. Um, I'm not smart enough to know which is correct, but uh, th- that would be an interesting thing to look back on this offseason at some point. Well, what's, what's yeah, really nice... Just, oh, go ahead, Joe. I'm just saying, yeah, defense. Defense and steals, I feel like, would be like the biggest potential X factor. I would like to see that. Like, Are the teams that are fucking bad at defense in last place right now? All of them? I don't. I never looked at it, but could be. Well, what 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 this what this running thing does is because I've had a real fear of the <clears throat> automated strike system impacting the catcher position and how valuable that that is, right? Because pitch framing goes by the wayside, and that's a massive, massive skill set. Quite like if you can do that. They almost don't give a shit whether or not you even take a bat with you up to the plate. They don't care. 
if you can steal strikes and you can control the running game now, you are as valuable as you've ever been in the catching position. I love that. Absolutely love that because we're getting away from going down a road where that position was going to be really powered by offensive productivity, which is what makes JT Real Muto and guys like Salvador Perez sort of unicorn-esque because of what they've been able to do offensively and defensively combined. And you've almost been okay with getting one or the other from that position, understanding you're never really going to get both. But now that the demand is there, the position maintains the need to be as well-rounded as possible. Because if you can't control the running game in a day and age where we've got the clock and guys are running like crazy, you're now a liability. And if you can't do that, well, you better you better be bringing something to the table offensively. And if you can't do that, you're playing the wrong fucking position now. And I like the idea that that's still the case until we entertain the automated strike zone, which I again, have reservations on. I think that's that's nice to see how it's going to impact or could impact that position. Uh, what do you got, Joe? You got you got any final thoughts? Anything you'd like to cap it off with? Well, I just Jay has said a lot, but Sandy Alcant. How do you say his fucking name, Alcantara? Because everyone a, says it, and it's just not spelled that way. Not not C H, like Alcantara. So Tura Tura Alcantara. Alcantara. Sandy Alcantara. Yeah, he's, so it's it's he's, almost like you're saying it together, but you're not. Contra. You know what else? That was my final thought. <laughs> Tell me. I'm kind of sad to admit this. I don't know if I, if this is going to be like, oh, you're fucking, you're freaking dumbass or you're a uh, what? But like, dude, I obviously I'm the stat. I'm the stat guy. I know all the stats. <laughs> and I dive into them and I know I find all these cool not, I wouldn't say nuggets, that's Jay Hayes thing, but I find cool <laughs> stats and I know all the numbers and stuff. And I've always <laughs> been an OPS guy. Always loved OPS. On base plus slugging. I already yep. I always knew it meant on base plus slugging. I For had sure. no idea until like last week they just add up your on base percentage and slugging to get that number. I didn't know that. I thought it was like an algorithm. <laughs> That's astounding. No, 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 Jay, Jay, just let's just let's just fucking absorb this right now. <laughs> I thought they were just, you know, I was like slugging. Like, how do they come up with slugging? I don't know, but I know if it's a good one. You know, there's some calculation. There's a oh. great. You got to get a, a chalkboard out and enter the variables, and you the, get an the OPS. Hold on, hold on. The chalkboard equation for slugging percentage is just total bases <laughs> and at bats. Yeah, well, that's easy for some people. That's harder for others. Like, oh. <laughs> I can't do I can't do slugging percentage. You can in my brain, maybe well, not my brain. well, maybe not in your brain, but you can easily with a calculator. It's just two numbers. I don't have a calculator <laughs> on me, so I'm just th- I'm just put it out there. I'm sure a lot of viewers maybe didn't know OPS was literally on base plus slugging, just how it says. All right. I, mean, <laughs> I bet a lot of the view. I bet a lot of the listeners and viewers did. Mm-mm. Oh my god, mm-hmm. we'll do Joey! I love you. I had no idea. Hey, I well, don't think we should we're... do a poll. I think that would be bad <laughs> no. credibility from the account. <laughs> what? What did you? What was the moment in time that you were like, "Oh, ho- hold on." Hold on. Are you fucking telling me <laughs> these things add up? <laughs> Are you telling me that it's been here the entire time? <laughs> like what was what was that moment? What when you read it, what were you looking up? What happened when you were like, holy shit? I don't know. I don't know. I might have been like I might have been listening to something or saw something, but I think it took me I've been sitting on it for a while. Like I didn't I didn't want to <laughs> say it out loud. Because I was part of me was thinking, I bet nobody knows this shit. I bet nobody knows. Like they, we're just all going off these numbers. It's if it's an eight, it's kind of good. Seven, you're you know, and then nine, you're really good. If, but I, all these other stats, they just throw stats at you all the time, and then you just figure out which ones are what number has to be a good number for you to be a good player. You know, and OPS kind of was just 
like I know war. War's not really war, you know. There's yeah. no killing. There's yeah, no, no for sure. wins above <laughs> six games. You know, it's not like if you win six games and the replacement player he didn't play a game, so then your team, you know, you don't get six wins because your team won six wins. OPS is just it's it's uh. If you guys don't know about OPS, look it up, and uh, that's my final thought. Get into it. <laughs> Cause you learn something new every day. <laughs> Next week we'll do about OPS plus. Cause when you start talking about OPS plus, it gets even fucking crazier. <laughs> oh my! Best baseball pod on the planet. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for every bit of that. All right. Well, I think that'll. I think that'll put a bow on it. Uh. Yeah, that was that was fantastic, Joe. Uh, Shohei Otani is an absolute god. That's about all I got. Uh, we will see you next week. Well.